Welcome to USA Football's Coach and Coordinator Podcast, where top football coaches from around the country share their stories, philosophies, concepts, and strategies to help you get better on and off the field. Now, here's your host, Keith Grabowski. Hey, coaches, before we get going today, I just wanted to thank you for all you've been doing to support this podcast. And we have an incredible lineup coming up here. Uh, We have just about every major college conference represented. We have a ton of FBS coaches, Division II coaches, Division III coaches, some great high school football coaches coming on the podcast to share with you and help you grow professionally during this time. I really appreciate all of you asking your questions on Twitter. Please follow me at Coach K Grabowski for our daily updates on our guests and your opportunity to ask questions. We will read them on the show and attribute those to you. So please contribute to the show as much as you can. Our football development model, which is something we've rolled out here at USA Football, and this is really for you to be able to help your youth football programs develop. It's about a long-term athlete development plan, something that comes off of the American development model, which is something that the USOC has put together The idea is that we're able to teach skills in a progression starting at the youngest ages. We're also looking at the different game types we have, whether that's flag, which is non-contact, limited contact games like padded flag or tackle bar, and full contact, and the right progressions for contact teaching there as well. Be sure to check out all we do at footballdevelopment.com and check out what we're doing with the FDM, the football development model, at usafootball.com backslash FDM. On today's podcast, we're going to focus on tempo, talking to a guy who was the offensive coordinator at the fastest school as far as number of plays in a game as well as least time of possession. But in doing that, they broke 14 school records. He's moved on since then where he was the offensive coordinator and is now defensive quality control at Louisiana Lafayette for the Raging Cajuns. And that's a, a repeat performer here on the podcast, Keith Bearfield. Keith, it's great to have you back here. It's good to be back. I've been around the world since we last talked, so it's about time we caught up. <laughs> and for our coaches, we we did talk about his background and spent some time on that in the last podcast we did. We'll we'll link that one in our show notes so you can learn more about Coach and some things he's learned along the way. However, this guy's been moving and shaking. Coach, you've been somewhere, I think, every year since we've talked to you last. As a matter of fact, I got married about six months after we talked, and that's when it all it all started and went from from Florida to Northwestern Oklahoma State, where I was a pass game coordinator at my alma mater. Then I moved on to University of Central Arkansas, working with the receivers. Quincy University as the offensive coordinator last year, and then just this January, took the move to the University of Louisiana, Raging Cajuns as a quality control. So now, as you've moved on there, as you said, it shifted to the defensive side. What's that transition like for you right now, as as you are working with? defensive coaches yeah you know, it's it's probably one of the intellectually most difficult things i've ever been through in my professional career you know you're you're flipping your brain on everything that you're doing you're trying to you know, grasp concepts that you haven't spent the last you know 30 years looking at and working through and trying to trying to play catch up and it's it's very frustrating. It's very draining. But the thing is, is you, know, you walk into it with a lot of optimism because you know you talk to you know, career offensive coordinators, play callers, and a lot of them, you know, if if they did spend time on the other side of the ball, it's one of the most valuable times of their career for what they're doing on offense. And, and guys who haven't, they almost all will say, "I wish I had." And so, you know, you're never gonna be able to space out a year and just say. You know what, I'm going to spend, you know, one year sabbatical on defense just to help myself out. Nobody can do that for a year. And so being able to get this opportunity and still young in my career um, is is going to be invaluable. And I can already start seeing it click and, um, and things kind of come together in my head. And I got, you know, I split my notes in half, but on the left side, it's what I need to know for the defense. It's on the right side, how I'm going to beat it when I get back on offense. So it's, it's a it's been a great process, and as hard as it is, that just means that I'm doing something worthwhile. So, yeah, it's like you're doing recon over there, right? Yeah, absolutely. 
and, and you've learned to draw upside down as well. That's right. Yeah, I've learned to draw upside down, and now I know I don't know which way is the correct way anymore. And I catch myself just flipping back and back and forth on my own personal notes, and it's it's been fun. Kind of, you know, I've studied how how the brain goes through the learning process and the difficulties of it and all that stuff, and just kind of experiencing it as almost an elementary defensive guy. It's, it's been fun. It's been humbling, but it's, it's been good. It is such an important thing. I think that, that you can learn both sides of the ball. And I remember in an interview for a head coaching job, this is when I was a high school coach. One of the, I, I did end up getting the job, but the athletic director told me, you know, one of the things that set me apart a little bit from all the candidates is, you know, they had me up on the board talking offense and defense and special teams. And, and when I went to talk defense, you know, I drew everything the other way. I drew it upside down. And, you know, a detail like that, being able to do that, understand that, really made a difference in me getting that job. Absolutely. Yeah, it makes you more well-rounded as a as a coach. You know, it's just like the, the left brain and the right brain, the, the smartest people in the world are the ones who can – interchange and connect both sides efficiently and so it's definitely beneficial i know it is like when when it gets hard i know to just keep pressing through because it, it'll be worth it in the end um, and the best coaches head coaches that i've that i've been around are the ones who who know what they're looking at on both sides of the ball not just one side and letting somebody run the other side of the ball like that's how you get two two sides working together for the same goal exactly i couldn't agree with you more well coach we'll we'll set aside the defensive stuff today and maybe make you feel a little bit more back at home and and talk some offense because you guys did some notable things there at quincy that's right yeah build up my confidence a little bit so i can press on through the rest of the year quincy was a challenge i got there january of, of last year and i was walking into a to an offense that for since those players have been there had been running the ball you know high formation power run game 21 12 personnel and and coach gary bass the head coach you know hired me to to do exactly the opposite of that he said he wants to go fast and he wants to throw the ball and you know he's speaking speaking to my heart when he said said those things so i showed up and then i realized these guys, you know, the quarterbacks hadn't thrown much in games. Like, they hadn't been taught that. I don't know that they've recruited receivers or not because you watch the film, you don't get much of an idea walking in there. And So I, I quickly started getting nervous about, you know, what I'd have or what we'd be able to, to do or if we'd be able to do anything. And so it turns out that the quarterback that, that was there, Andrew Run, was just, you know, a godsend. Like he'd be sitting there waiting for me to get there and put in this offense. And uh, we had about nine receivers who who caught a ball um, in every game. Like we we'd complete a pass to about nine different people a game. So we had athletes there who who could do this. And one of the things that that really gave us a little little niche in in our season was was our tempo. And we knew we needed to find something that was different that you know, teams weren't going to see every week to where, you know, we could we could try to find an edge. And, you know, with with that, we broke 14 school records on offense, which is all credit to the players and, and the work they put in. And I couldn't have been more satisfied with, with everything that we did do last year. The transition. Let's talk about that a little bit before we get into – you know, the, the tempo. So uh, I imagine you got a, a spring ball with these guys and then, then a summer or, or fall camp to work with them. But there's, there's a brand new way of doing things. So how do you make that transition from being kind of, I quote unquote, that old school type of team to being the fastest team in America? First thing was, was attitude. And you know, my, my, my first goal when I showed up was, was to show a very, you know, vibrant attitude one who was you know the the rule i have for for myself personally and any any team that i'm with is always be the most excited to be there doing what you're doing you know enthusiasm is the grease to success and you know i was always 
trying to just get the guys excited about what we were about to do. And the first step in being as fast as we were was starting as slow as we could possibly start. And, you know, my father-in-law was in the military and he, did, he taught me that when they would practice their operations, it was going by the code of slow as smooth and smooth as fast. And so, you know, I think one of the the biggest mistakes people make when they're trying to be a tempo team is they just try to do the same thing that they're doing, but just tell their guys to go faster about it. I didn't want to just say go faster because I don't think that's a very valid coaching point in my opinion. So we have very detailed rules set out for our guys on how to be you know, tempo. And that was part of it was you know, whenever the play's over, Whenever a certain play is over, whoever has the ball, if you get tackled on the sideline, you don't give it to the sideline referee. You don't just leave it on the ground. You take it inside the hash to the umpire because he'll put the ball down and we're ready to go. But if you let the sideline referee take it, he's going to set it there. They're going to throw a new ball in. Then the umpire has to line it up, and that takes time. And so other things that were, if you didn't have the ball at the end of the play, and you weren't an offensive lineman, we should see on film your head snap to the sideline to get the signal before the film cuts off. I mean, we monitored that throughout practices and and everything, and the offensive line, they needed to run to the ball. And they didn't have to get in a stance, but they had to get to where they didn't have to move their feet when they did get in a stance. So that way we could just boom, boom, and go. But you can't do that day one, right? So it was very very methodical and walking through it and talking through it as we were walking through it and then slowly building speed once we got the muscle memory of how things are supposed to operate. You know, the, the last thing you want to do is when you are teaching a whole new thing to a bunch of people is let them learn it wrong and then have to reteach them, which is going to take twice as long. And so we are very deliberate in that and, we weren't overly complicated, but you, know, you are what what you hold them accountable to. And you know, if I let it slide, then that's exactly who we were going to be—a team that wanted to be fast, but not quite as fast as as they could have been. And so we were very very aware of making sure that we were exactly right from the very beginning, and it paid dividends in the end. The detail there is such an important one, right? And they always talk about it in any clinic, you take away one thing. My my goal is that we at least give one thing in every episode we do here. And so that one's in my notebook, at least, as far as coaching the tempo and getting getting what you need off of film. You know, un, unless you're somebody who says, leave the film on, which I've done in practice before as, as we've installed tempo at different places, just let it roll so we can evaluate how fast we are. But but that I love that idea of the receivers, expectation of the receivers that their heads snap to the sideline. I love that somebody's running the ball in. Like the the operation time, you know, you could study it. You have to study a live game to figure it out, or at least you know, a game that's recorded and maybe on TV. That, but basically, and I did this at, at one point trying to figure out how to be more efficient with with tempo as far as when we want to go fast. Is you're going to have depending on where the ball is, depending on the crew, 9 to 11 seconds. But I think a very good point there is that you're going to cut that down if that guy is, is, like you said, getting inside the hash to give the football. I've heard people say, just give the ball to an official. But you're right. That's going to add time. You, you give it to the side judge. He's putting it down. They're lining up, getting another one. That adds seconds, right? And if you're somebody who wants to be as fast as you can, you don't want that ball going from the side judge to the guy on the side, the ball boy on the sideline, and, and then back into the middle, you just added four to five seconds. Yeah, four, I mean, there's a lot you can communicate and adjust in your alignment in four to five seconds if you're on the defensive side. You know, like that could be the difference between a busted coverage and, and a, you know, a pass breakup. So and we practice that every day on air and then against our defense and, and I always said that, uh, you know, tempo is a lifestyle. Like, you, you know, if we're going to be fast and we're just going to be fast in everything we do. And this is a true story that when I said that for the first time last spring, I switched my 
a cell phone carrier from AT&T to Sprint because Tim a lifestyle and everything we're going to do is bad. But along with that, too, though, you got to have some sort of system to to call plays and, and to be able to you know, get the signal, know the play, and run it well in that amount of time. And so we had different ways of, of doing that. We went off of the wristband just like we did at Southeastern last time last time we talked and all I had to do was say a number and they basically had the whole card memorized, you know, by the end of spring ball. And so all I'm saying is 21 and they're lining up and going and I'm making sure that if I want them to be tempo, I have to be tempo with, with having the play call ready to go as soon as they do snap their head, heads around and look at me. And so, uh, but then we also had other, kind of buzzwords or you know one of them being you know like like run it we just start yelling run it run it run it and that was a play that changed you know week to week but it was one play one formation one direction every single time and and they knew they heard run it and they were sprinting to the ball and and that's exactly what we were doing so I mean we had a bunch of words like that we could use and you know and having a plan of Okay, when we are in tempo, we're not just going to throw darts at the board. We're going to have a rhyme and a reason for what we do. We're going to do it well, and we're going to do it as fast as we can possibly do it. I think that's an interesting concept. And back when I first learned tempo, and I'm not saying this philosophy is wrong, but you know, one of the guys I was learning it from, his idea was like, the analogy he used was feeding a three-point shooter, right? Like, you just keep feeding the ball. I mean, he may, may miss early on, but he's going to get going. And that was the feeling of what he wanted it to do. Now, for somebody who was used to maybe having more purpose to a play call or understanding what you know what you wanted to do in certain situations against certain looks, et cetera, uh, that was still always has been a little foreign to me and not a philosophy that I, you know, that I carried forward when I was running the offense. And I think that's kind of what, what you're saying here is not throwing darts at the board, that uh, there is a little bit more as far as the methodology behind it. I guess if you could speak in general to you know the, the kind of thought process you're putting into it as far as what you want to do as the play caller. Right. And so uh, every play had its clear reasoning for what, what I was thinking in the play. So, But we also had at fail safes and within the plays that that could be corrected within you know a half second to, to get us in the right call so for instance if say i called some sort of pass concept you know whether let's just say it's a like like a fail concept to the to the boundary or to the field didn't matter if if we lined up and our quarterback glanced over there and the defense was over rotated or we just didn't like the look for whatever we called we'd always have a single receiver concept backside that was just about the same week to week maybe a little different based off what we've been doing or what their defense has shown and so we'd look over there if that if uh, we didn't like the concept that we called and we'd usually go to the single receiver now if the single receiver seemed to be covered too then that only means one thing that the box is empty and we should be running the ball. And so we had a quick little off off call that just checked the inside zone and we could do, you know, that's all a matter of as the quarterback's lining up five yards behind the center and just glancing left, glancing right, didn't like either off off and clap his hands and we go. So and then on the flip side of that, every run play had a you know, I don't I don't want to call it an RPO because we weren't necessarily reading somebody, but if they were giving us room to get a nice, easy quick out or, or slant and because we did expanded splits and they were just crowding the box, we'd forget the run and just catch it and dish it out there to our guy and get seven, eight yards, break a tackle, maybe 30, 40 yards. So that, you know, the, the thing you get with tempo is guys are, you know, they can either be, clump together in the box trying to figure out where to go or spread out trying to get to where we are and so we had to have a a way of getting to a run play if they were 
you know, all spread out or getting to getting the ball outside and on a pass play real quick if they were clumped together right there near the box. And that was all built in since day one to, to take advantage of when we did see that. And, you know, early on in spring, did we do it very well? No, but I wanted them to work it and to fail at it and, and to see why they should do it or why they shouldn't check to it and, and kind of get used to it because, you know, a three-year-old doesn't know why he shouldn't touch a hot stove till he touches it and they will never do it again. So it was, a, it was a lot of failure early on, but once we got used to it and to the rhythm of it, we realized the issues we were having getting used to the speed are the issues that the defenses are going to have getting used to the speed on the game day. So that's, that's kind of what our philosophy was. Now, from uh, the standpoint of, of practice, you know, we've talked a little bit about the install and, and making that part of your team's lifestyle, part of what they do. And so they're getting used to doing things for the coaches in practice. You know, you get into team or whether it's, you know, different group periods, et cetera. How are you guys working the mechanics of, you know, the plays going in? How does that work in practice for you guys? Full operations or how do you do it? One thing that we, we did a really good job of was compartmentalizing, you know, that some periods were meant for teaching and some were meant for executing. And so basically if we were just going against like a scout team or something, then we we pause between every play and work out the details and make sure we got it right. But, you know, when there was time for seven on seven, and that's when I mean, even – you know, the plays are doing seven on seven. We were rolling through those as fast as we could go and, and making it a game like situation to where you know, we're not going to stop the game to talk about you know, the, the missed assignment that you had or the wrong read that you made. Uh, we're, we're just going to pick up and go and, and talk about it when we get a chance to later. And so, we, one thing that, that I believe helped us the most operationally and and with the speed of our tempo was we started off every day after stretch. The first thing we did, we called it team tempo. And we'd start on the 50 yard line and I'd call a play from the sideline and they'd spring onto the field, run the play. And we'd do about five, six plays. It's just driving uh, from the 50 to the end zone, spotting the ball based off the hash that we throw it to or run it to. And, and then ending up for the, with the score at the end, it would be on air. But the point of it was all of us coaches were watching as closely as we could. And if somebody lined up wrong and tried to readjust their feet as the ball was being snapped, we'd start all the way over, like from the very beginning sideline, get on the field and go. And it has to be six perfect plays to score a touchdown as fast as we can go. And when we score a touchdown, you better go celebrate like you just won the Super Bowl because touchdowns are hard and we're not going to just mosey over to the sideline after a touchdown. We're going to, we're going to celebrate. So uh, we got, we got used to when we didn't feel like celebrating on some Tuesdays in you know, October, we, we faked it as best we could. So everything had to be right. And we wouldn't, we would not move on to the next part of practice, no matter how long it took to finish. It would be two drives with the, with the first group and the second group. So, Coach, talk a little bit more. You know, you mentioned this, getting it right. And I've, I've heard guys talk about, well, we, we just, you know, we're, we're not going to slow anything down. We're to coach off film, et cetera. That philosophy in this and in, in your approach as far as corrections that need to be made as you guys get into, you know, your up-tempo stuff in, in practice? We talked about with the, with the team tempo part, it's on air. It, you know, I'm not calling the, the brand new game plan, but I'm calling the every, every week, every day plays. And, and really the, when, when you mess up in that drill, you know, 90% of the time it's because you just weren't focused enough or you just don't feel like, you know, doing it as best you can for whatever reason. And so I, I thought that that practice period was always a good 
time in the day for me to reiterate that I'm not going to lower my standard on these things about what we're doing out here. If I let you get away with it, then then that's what we're going to be. And so, um, yeah, there are times when you know you don't need to sit there and give a dissertation over every little mistake of, about it. But you know, to me, that was it's on air and and doing it right was really just a matter of choice for the most part. And we all needed to be on the same page that either all eleven of us are going to do this, or none of us are going to are going to do it so being able to separate when it is a time to do that and when it's a time to you know we just need to get reps and get work in and we'll talk about it later it's a very lot easier said than done in, in my opinion and i'm not sure that i got it right 100 percent of the time but i felt like i you know i, I was doing as good as i could have done you know, just about every day i mean i remember you know, one time in, in, in that team tempo period, like the guys didn't do something exactly right towards the end, and I wasn't the one who caught it. I actually was going to let him slide with it, and as uh, our head coach, Coach Bass, jumped in and said, no, start all the way over. Like, we have a standard. And so like that kind of put a fire inside of me, like, dang, I almost just let it slide like that. And, you know, it was it was a good – attitude builder of this is who we are this is who we're going to be and we're not you know, either either do it or don't and so very good culture builder for for our offense in that one something that we we really took pride in towards the end of the year as well definitely the the other thing i'd like to to talk to you about here is use of personnel so you are uh, running a lot more plays than a typical team well, more than everybody else, right? Number one in America. So, division yeah, two, Division Two. Um, how how does that affect reps for the guys who are starters? Is is there a, a point where you'd like to, you know, you think you max them out on? I know those are things we've looked at before, and kind of was player to player, like determining, you know, this certain kid right here, maybe he's a younger player, like, and he's good for about. 50 reps in the game and then you know we got to start giving them to somebody else and you know etc different guys who could handle not just the speed of it from a conditioning standpoint but probably maybe some of the the mental part too before you saw breakdowns anything you've looked at in that regard yeah you know we essentially had three full groups of of receivers that would that would rotate in in games and not wholesale all at one time or anything like that kind of you know, would phase them in and out, and and really that's more credit to, to Coach Ryan Olson, who's, who's the offensive coordinator now and was a receivers coach for me last year. He kind of, you know, to me, like I want the starters in and I want the starters in the whole time. And in my mind, I think it's like a game of Madden where you can just turn the tee off. I guess we never hesitated to to sub in and out from the guys that we knew could would be functional and, and, and efficient in what they were doing. And we we got enough reps in practice to to know that they could do it. And, you know, each game, I think we completed a pass to nine or ten different receivers. And, you know, I, I don't want to say we put a play count on them or this or that. You can you can kind of tell when, when guys are starting to get gassed and we let them be honest with us and don't, you know, they don't have to lie to us. and try to act tough and anything like that. But if they needed a breather, that's fine because the defensive guys probably need a breather too. And if we get a guy who's fresh in there against somebody who's who's tired, that's that's our advantage. So and then also if you a little I hope no referees are, are, are listening, but if you substitute fast enough, like as soon as the play's over and they kind of do like a hockey line switch where they just jump in and out before the ball is even spotted, like they'll typically not really hold you up from snapping the ball if you do it as, as soon as the play is over. So if you can, like they'll hold their hands up like they are waiting, but as they don't even have the ball uh, spotted yet, so it doesn't even matter. Okay? And so it's so like most of our game plan plays that required 
motion and probably more thought than just saying a number or this and that. Those would come when, when we substituted with, after a timeout, you know, from the sideline when we wanted to slow down. Uh, I wouldn't just throw them in there, try to go as fast as seemingly possible with, with the newer stuff because that's just not not putting them in a position for success. And so that's kind of how we would catch our breath for a second, you know, bounce back. And I didn't want to be full gas the whole way through, slowing it down from time to time is, is a good thing. You know, those indie car racers have to hit the brakes to win the race and make all those turns as well. So you got to know when to slow it down and when to speed it up. Last question really for you here. One more thing on, on practice. Certainly in practice and, and, again, making tempo a lifestyle, the scout team has to live that lifestyle as well. Best tips for getting the scout team to line up and allow you guys to do what you need to do? That's a great question, actually. Something that took a couple of seasons for me to figure out myself. And really, what, what you can do a few things. And so one thing that, that probably worked the best for us was giving them essentially – one scout card and say, hey, the next five plays, you're going to do the same play over and over, and we're going to line up as fast as we can and, and get it, you know, get it to you. So try and keep up as best you can. And, you know, was it perfect? Like, was it, you know, as, as good as getting five different looks? No. But mostly defenses won't give you more than one or two different looks when you're going that fast. And, and really all we're trying to create is, uh, you know, a defensive line and linebackers in the box, not in a, a uniform set, like running an inside zone to, to, you know, a bunch of guys kind of clumped here and there and, and learning how to, how to you know, work through those blocks and you know who you have and you know, what you should do when, when you get three guys, you know, in, in, in one gap or something. And, and that's that's what we created by doing that, and um, that was always a challenge. But um, I think one thing that we we did a lot of in practice that most teams probably shy away from in season is we go good on good versus our defense uh, a good a good bit of the time more than anywhere else I'd ever been. And you know we'd actually unscripted and practice calling plays through a rhythm and just getting used to that and. The, the more you can, even for the coaches, make it feel like a game and a game-like situation to where we have to be on the sideline. They have to get the signal from us. I can't be out there on the field and telling it to him in his ear. I don't know what the next play is. I have to think, all right, but what's not working? What is working? What should we do? The more, the more reps you get, the better you're going to be at it, right? Like, I'm learning that on the defensive side of the ball, the more – reps I get at working through all these installs and, and teaching it, the better I'm going to be at it sooner. And so um, by the time the game game day came around, we we prepared and gone through the rhythm of it and, and seen how fast we can go with everything that we do have against a good defense. And you know, it wasn't the first time trying these things out, I guess. Well, Coach, I know – you probably enjoy being able to talk offense here, and we gave you a respite from the defensive side of the ball, but you're going to get back to it there with the Raging Cajuns and appreciate you taking the time for sure, and best of luck to you and your team in 2020. Well, I hope the next time we talk, I haven't moved every single year since, since now, So, but I, I appreciate you having me back, though. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. Coaches, again, I want to remind you of what we're doing with the football development model Please push this down to your youth coaches. I think this is a great way for you to get some organization and structure beyond what you've already done. Check it out, all of our, our program development for youth football at fdm.usafootball.com. Again, check out our systems for blocking, tackling, and defeating blocks at footballdevelopment.com. If you register with your email, you get your choice of three free videos. There's some great things in there. I think things that as you get going again, you can get into the summer and maybe make up on some things that you might have lost if you had a spring ball, if you had time here in the spring to work on football. Some great drills for all those phases of contact. If you're enjoying the podcast, 
please head over to iTunes or your platform and give us a five-star rate. If you have a minute, write a review. We really appreciate it, and we will read your review on our highlight show that we do at the end of the week. 